Hello and welcome to your August Investor Update. I'm Jason Conan Davis and I'm Head of Trading here at Nutmeg. As we're continuing to work remotely, I'm joined here today by our Chief Investment Officer, James McManus, via Zoom. Hi James. Hi Jason. James, at the start of the month, we thought we'd see some significant easing of lockdown restrictions and some green shoots of economic recovery. However, in the latter half of the month, we've started to see some potential concerns of a second wave of coronavirus. How have the markets reacted? Well, that's right. Not just in the UK, Jason, but globally, lockdown restrictions have begun to ease in, in July. Um, that's been a huge positive for parts of the economy that rely on physical access or physical interactions, in particular sectors that have until now faced some of the tightest restrictions on activity, sectors such as hospitality and leisure and travel. Uh, but it's really the actions of policymakers, corporate earnings and the renewed US and China tensions that have tended to move the market this month, uh, rather than the number of COVID cases and, and the easing of COVID restrictions. So on the policy front, we've seen EU leaders uh, agree a symbolic EU recovery fund that really provides for a coordinated EU response that importantly doesn't add to the, be the debt burden uh, of the Southern European countries. And we've also seen the Federal Reserve underline its commitment to whatever it takes policy, extending its domestic lending program, uh, extending the liquidity provisions for foreign banks and encouraging Congress uh, to agree a further stimulus package for the unemployed. And it's done so whilst also reiterating its low interest rates for longer stance. Now, on the flip side, we've seen the fallout from the enforcement of security law in Hong Kong has continued and ten the tensions between the US and China uh, have again increased in July. We've seen visa restrictions on Huawei workers, uh, the closure of consulates, and sanctions and visa restrictions for politicians on both sides. And, and the US has really increased its rhetoric, calling for an end to the blind engagement of the Western uh, nations with China, uh, and calling on its allies to take deeper and harder action against China in conjunction with the action the US has taken. So with the November election fast approaching, um, we do expect that nationalist rhetoric to continue, but importantly, investors will be also looking at the Democratic Party's policies to try and ascertain the strength of that approach uh, and whether that will continue if there are changes in, in the White House. Um, Markets-wise, you know, US equity markets were the star performers in the, in the developed market stock markets in July. Uh, they delivered really strong returns in the face of losses from European, UK and Japanese stock markets. Uh, the tech-heavy Nasdaq leading the way there with gains of over 7%. The second quarter earnings have really underlined the growth leadership in the big US technology companies. Um, emerging markets, meanwhile, also had a very strong month, one of their best for some time, outperforming developed markets by over 4%. Uh, helped in part by a weaker US dollar and with both US equity markets and emerging market equities both being priced in US dollars uh, that means the returns for sterling based investors this month are actually much lower due to a weaker dollar so the pound gained 5.7% against the US dollar in the month of July that means that much of the strong equity market performance overseas has been wiped out for unhedged UK investors. Um, on the bond side, government bonds have been buoyed by the, the continued stance of policymakers to do whatever it takes to keep interest rates anchored towards uh, zero in, in the near term. Um, you know, rising COVID infections in the US, but also in, in other regions, really haven't fractured confidence yet. But I think it's clear we'll continue to experience isolated lockdowns as the recovery continues. In fact, we think we'll see um, you know, periodic regional lockdowns being an increasing feature uh, of the landscape for the next 12 months, unless, of course, uh, a success, successful vaccine can be, can be found. Thanks, James. You mentioned it briefly there. At the end of July, companies start reporting their Q2 earnings. With a lot of focus on how big tech has performed, why are technology and growth stocks performing better than traditional businesses? And are they the main driver for the stock market gains we've seen since the lows of March? That's correct. So we're currently in the middle of earnings seasons for the second quarter of the year, and that means companies are now reporting how they performed in the period from the start of April 2020 to the end of June. And this period in particular has taken on significant importance this year for two reasons. But firstly, it's the first time investors will get real world visibility uh, of the true impacts of COVID on individual companies, particularly in the US. If you remember back to the beginning of the crisis, this was really it was really well into March before the US took action on, on locking down its economy. And so the first quarter, quarter earnings uh, reflected only a small part of, of that impact. But secondly, investors have really been waiting with bated breath 
to hear companies' perspectives on what's been taking place, their outlooks on the remainder of the year, particularly from those companies that are considered economic bellwethers. And that's to try and gain a deeper understanding as to what's going on uh, in the global economy. And, and as far as the results go, so far we've had just over half of the S&P 500 companies report earnings. Um, on an absolute basis, and, and as expected, they've been pretty poor. Um, so far, an average sales growth in the region of negative 12%. Uh, an average earnings growth in the region of negative 10%. But that's actually significantly better uh, than investors on the whole believed it would be, which is certainly a positive when taken alongside some of the more positive activity data that we've received recently from a macroeconomic perspective. Um, meanwhile, in Europe, we've had about two thirds of the Euro stocks 50 report uh, their earnings for that quarter. Um, here, the story is a little bit bleaker, average sales growth of negative 27%, and negative 27% earnings growth over the period. So a much tougher corporate earnings picture for European equities. That really reflects the extent to which Northern European industrial nations are struggling with a muted global trade environment. Um, but as you mentioned, technology stocks are indeed the bright spot. And in fact, we've seen a, a very strong set of earnings from the major US-based mega cap technology companies. And they really stand at odds with what is happening with uh, companies in, in, in other economic sectors. So we'd already had a, a very strong set of results from the likes of Microsoft and Tesla. Uh, and last week it was the turn of Apple, Amazon, Facebook and Google. And all four companies exceeded expectations. Um, amongst the highlights, Apple having its second best ever quarter for MacBook sales. Overall revenues up 11% in the second quarter. Uh, Amazon saw its fastest ever unit sales growth rate of 57% for the quarter. Uh, and despite incurring $4 billion of additional charges, uh, additional costs in that quarter, revenue was up 40% overall. Incredibly strong results. Meanwhile, Facebook delivered 11% uh, uh, revenue growth despite an advertising boycott uh, specifically targeting Facebook and also advertising revenues globally falling. Uh, whilst Google actually surprised analysts with its resilience, revenue is down around 2% but in the face of a, a very challenging environment. So, you know, why are technology companies performing so well? Well, I guess the first thing to say here is that this isn't just a COVID thing. Um, mega cap technology stocks, in particular the famous FANG stocks, have been dominant for some time. Uh, they've increased their relative size in, in the US stock market and they've really been the growth engine of, of that market in terms of the earning per share growth. Uh, that we've seen coming through in, in the last two years. Uh, so the largest five stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google now account for 22% of the total index uh, by weighting. And at its heart, this is really reflective of, of business models that offer ongoing growth leadership, you know, innovative and expanding product sets, increasing market dominance in, in terms of their market share, uh, and increasing recurring revenues. And in this environment, investors have really viewed those companies as the least cash challenge. Remember, they tend to have uh, large cash stockpiles, uh, and then potentially the least disrupted by the shutdowns and the best position for uh, sustained growth. And so despite the valuations of these companies being relatively high, uh, particularly relative to their own history, you know, they have continued to deliver that strong growth, and that's growth that investors at the moment are willing to pay up for in the current market environment. So there is some positive news for the economic outlook. What shape do you think the economic recovery will take? That's right. Alongside company earnings, we've seen some positive signs in the macroeconomic data in recent weeks, with manufacturing activity turning up across the world alongside a bounce in some of the consumer data, such as retail sales. And I think if you look at the financial market recovery, then you'd be hard pressed at the current time to call it anything other than, than V-shaped. But it's possibly too early to tell whether the recovery in the real economy will be as V-shaped, because much of it is dependent on the path of the medical issues and the path to reopening economies. But we're seeing some positive signs, and we can certainly uh, make some educated guesses as to the trajectory, but we are, to some extent, still in, in the eye of the storm. Uh, we only have one or two months' worth of hard economic data, uh, and we need to take that high-frequency data, such as activity surveys, uh, with a pinch of salt due to the, the influence of sentiment there. But one of the key questions uh, is whether we have the confidence yet that the reopening, economies, the reopening of economies can be managed effectively. And the evidence from Asian nations, from, from European nations, is that it's, it's difficult, but it's doable, uh, with regional rather than national lockdowns as a control mechanism. And we're beginning to see that now in the, in the UK too. 
Um, what we can also say for certain is that policymakers across the globe are committed to driving a robust economic recovery and to do whatever it takes to use the words of the US Federal Reserve. Um, you know, the IMF global forecasts, uh, growth forecasts, for example, support this alongside uh, an OBR forecast for the UK, which show V-shaped like uh, bounces in growth next year. Um, but it's unlikely to be a linear path and there will no doubt be bumps in the road as, as we uh, progress on that, on that reopening of economies. Um, another thing we can say for sure is that re the recovery will likely be uneven. Um, it will require structural change in some industries, the reskilling of workers, possibly even a rethink about how we work and where we work, um, and how quickly labor markets can adjust to the new normal. It's going to be really important for how quickly economies can recover. So we don't spend too much time uh, trying to forecast the exact shape of the underlying economic recovery in letter terms. Um, I think what it's easy to forget is that COVID isn't the only dynamic at play in the global economy. It's clear that COVID is here to stay, that we'll face disruption in some form, even on a localized basis for months or years to come, or at least until we have uh, effective control measures such as vaccines in place. Uh, but there are many other dynamics still at play in, in the global economy. The US-China trade war that began back in 2018, uh, the Brexit negotiations that are yet to be resolved, and a really important US election in November that will determine uh, US policy in, in the coming years. So it's really important to take a, a holistic view uh, about what's going on in the global economy rather than just focus solely on COVID when it comes to thinking about the global economic recovery. Thanks, James. So against this backdrop, how did the Nutmeg fully managed portfolios perform? Well, as is often the case in months where we see a lot of dispersion between the returns of different assets, the diversified nature of our portfolios means that returns are, are somewhere in the middle. So for July, it's been a relatively muted month for performance. Uh, lower risk fully managed portfolios showed gains of around 0.3%, uh, and the higher risk fully managed portfolios delivered returns of around 0.4%. But it was really the medium risk portfolios that delivered the strongest returns, uh, returns for the month of July of around 0.6%. And in this environment, have you made any changes to the Nutmeg fully managed portfolios? Uh, we did make some small changes during the month of July to manage the risk in our portfolios. That included rebalancing our equity exposure to ensure we remained in line with our investment view. So as equity markets drifted higher, we've taken the opportunity to, to trim our overall equity exposure ensuring we re remain slightly underweight what would be our typical long-term position. Uh, but we also rebalanced some of our European equity positions and that included trimming our exposure to the Nordics region. Uh, that's performed phenomenally well year to date. It's outperformed the wider European equity market by around 15%. Uh, we also increased our exposure to the social responsible European equity strategy. That's the thing that we continue to believe will perform strongly in the, in the medium term. Thank you. So this month's customer question comes from Ben, who's asked, given Nutmeg offers a fully managed, socially responsible portfolio range, why do you still offer the standard fully managed portfolios? Well, thanks for the question, Ben. Um, our socially responsible portfolios are for those investors who really want to seek greater alignment between their personal values and, and their investments. And they offer investors the opportunity to exclude companies engaged in controversial activities from their portfolios whilst overweighting companies that, that lead their industry peers when it comes to their alignment to environmental, social and, and governance norms. And this means uh, in tandem a much lower carbon intensity uh, and, a, and a greater alignment to ESG values. Um, now, the goal of those portfolios is, is to offer that approach with no trade-offs against the core investment principles that we at Nutmeg believe are key to long-term investing success. Principles such as global diversification, keeping costs as low as possible, transparency and, and offering daily liquidity. But we also recognize that this style of investing is a personal choice. Um, you know, whilst the concepts behind that approach are, are not necessarily new, many investors are only now becoming familiar with this approach. And so not every type of investment asset is available in that form as yet. So to some extent, it comes down to personal choice. Um, and while we're committed to offering choice, we also want to provide greater education on socially responsible investments to empower our customers' decision-making over which investment style to choose. So we strongly believe that, that ESG should be a consideration when you're investing. Um, we're working really hard at, at Nutmeg to incorporate ESG considerations into our wider investment process. We currently hold around 18% of all of our equity exposure across our standard fully managed portfolios in ESG-focused strategies, which is 
partly a reflection of our belief in, in that ESG theme and, and methodology in the medium term, and partly a preference to have a much lower carbon intensity in our portfolios in the medium term. But as I mentioned, not every type of asset class is available in ESG4 as yet, but as product development uh, evolves, it's likely we'll see many more asset classes become available for socially responsible portfolios, and therefore it's very likely we'll also see many more ESG focused approaches to assets in our wider portfolios too. Um, in the meantime, if that, that is a topic that interests you, please do read the white paper that's available on our website. Um, we've also uh, hosted a recent webcast on the topic that's available via our YouTube channel. And as always, there's lots of great content on socially responsible investing uh, via our blog, Nutmeganomics. Thanks, James. Thanks, Jason. And thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for the investment team, please get in touch with us via social, email, or in the comment section below. We look forward to seeing you again next month.